All right, um, so now I'm happy to introduce our second guest speaker. This is Cameron Turner, um, who was introduced to me by Rob Hamilton, who's a recent Karma PhD. So, like, he mentioned you to me several times, so I'm glad we finally yeah, cool. had a chance to meet. So, welcome. All right, thank you. So, um, so yeah, Rob is actually in the air right now, otherwise he'd be here. He'll put together some of the material, so I'm going to record it, um, and hopefully he and others can enjoy it. But um, what I wanted to walk through today is sort of generally data sonification as a notion. I'm going to talk about it from a couple of different angles and show you guys some examples of, of um, some work that we've done at the Data Guild. Um, I'll start off just by telling you a little bit about myself. So I like knowing about my speakers because you can figure out how they're biased um, before you hear what they have to say. So I did my undergrad grad in the Northeast at Dartmouth and then I uh, ended up at Microsoft um, with a long stint in research, so doing um, research, uh, consumer research, and doing focus groups and surveys and that kind of thing, and got interested in instrumentation this was a long time ago in the 90s, and we started by um, building instrumentation into the products, uh, like Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. Um, and in the very beginnings, before you could rely on the internet, or the internet was a biasing factor, we actually had people put their files on a floppy disk and mail them to us, so it tells you um, how old I am. So, <clears throat> so we went from there, obviously, into collecting data over the internet. Um, I got interested in the notion um, of, uh, so I left there, got married, moved to the UK for a bit, and um, did my MBA at Oxford. And the reason I chose that program is they sort of let you start a company. So I had this idea um, of a company I wanted to start um, called um, Clickstream. Um, and Clickstream was basically taking this notion of data uh, collection from instrumentation to observation. So um, you have a system or an agent that sits next to your software and observes everything you do. And we had some secret sauce using accessibility APIs in order to get, grab feature level information out of both websites and client um, installed clients, so prepackaged software. Um, so started that in uh, 2004 and then grew it um, in Berkeley um, until 2009, and during that period, I think Lewis's example was great because we had we were in the top floor of a retail um, building right by Pete's Coffee there in North Berkeley, if you're familiar. And um, it was super hot, and we hosted our own servers. Um, so the big challenge was just air conditioning. So we'd literally just like roast the rest of the office would roast while just to keep the servers cool, so that we could do our our nightly intake and processing. Um, but we were a SQL shop and did. Um, collect and store, aggregation, so all the things that have been solved now. Um, so that was a, it was a fun time, uh, but definitely the wild west in terms of trying to do anything that remotely looked like big data. And actually we looked at AWS at that time and they were doing, their pricing model was on a per transaction basis because the idea was a row of data is like a purchase or something that you care about. So it was like 10 cents per row and we were collecting every click from every user across a thousand users per panel times multiple you know, panels that we're running for different clients, and so it was just ridiculous. So the whole world's changed since then, and now just assume that you can have those problems solved for you through some of the technologies that Lewis described. Um, so in 2009, we were acquired by Microsoft. We got built into Windows, so we're now the Windows Experience uh, Improvement Program uh, that you can opt into and that collects data. Um, when we were acquired, I went with that deal back to Redmond and led the team that did all inbound um, data for Microsoft, basically. So Windows error reporting, usage reporting, all product activation, um, so the five by five product keys, all that kind of stuff. Um, and there, again, we had some of the old school challenges this 2009 to 2012, but we built a couple of data centers um, um, in different places, Japan and then in the Northwest, up next to the Grand Coulee Dam, because that's where the power is really cheap. And the reason you need power is actually not to run um, the servers, it's to run the air conditioning to keep the servers cool. Um, so it all comes back to physics, I guess that's the, <clears throat> that's the story for what's going on on the hardware side. Um, so I spent, um, so I did my three years there um, and then was doing recruiting here at, at Stanford for, for my team in telemetry with the um, folks in the stats program and I got really into the interviews and like started hearing about the courses and then also heard about StartX. Um, do you guys know what StartX is? Raise your hand. Yeah, okay, cool, Every, almost everyone. So StartX is the on, well not on campus, but it's the Stanford Student Accelerator. Um, and so I applied to become an entrepreneur in residence there. 
Uh, more importantly, um, you guys wouldn't know this, uh, but Stanford has the best nursery school in the entire universe, um, <laughs> being nursery. Yeah, okay, so you know. So yesterday was their 50-year birthday, um, but my daughter got in there, and that was way more interesting than like me getting into the Stanford stats program or for starting. But all those three of those things happened, and so um, I came, came here. Um, and did my master's, um, and sort of at the same time met up with a couple other folks that had exited companies and were sort of wondering what to do next. And um, so we formed a group called the Data Guild here in Palo Alto in 2012, and um, since then have been just growing and doing um, a lot of different kinds of data consulting. Um, and then I guess the next thing is I'm not sure kind of what's next for me, so I'm kind of in that discernment process myself. So um, just a brief uh, word about the Data Guild. So we're here in, in Palo Alto. Um, we do run um, internships each quarter for folks, or apprenticeships we call them. Uh, but the idea was bring together people who are sort of best in class in what they do. Um, so there's Cloudera stuff, so Paco Nathan, Databricks and our advisors, uh, folks in healthcare, um, folks from Cloudera and Slack. Um, and so yeah, so kind of folks from all over the world, all walks of life, increasingly interested in IoT and sensors, um, healthcare. Um, and we've done um, a few different kinds of projects, but really like what brings us together is we were looking for problems that had some social impact, so um, things that uh, data was well suited to solve, which is not every problem. <laughs> People are sort of surprised to learn like some, some issues, it's not the data that's the issue, um, it can be other things. Um, and then also we're a for-profit, so we're looking for you know, projects that paid. Um, and that last one is, with, when you mix that with social impact, your VIN sort of shrinks a lot. But, um, but anyway, that's, that's kind of like how we, how we started out. Um, and so in the last few years, we've, we've been lucky to work with a lot of different folks. And um, just to reiterate a point that Lewis made that I think is important, and, and maybe this is um, to Blair's question as well, you know, this no, we're in a special time right now, which is the, the things you can learn in you know, CST29 and the stats classes here at Stanford. You can, you can go out and, and do, do things with them. You need to learn you know, some tooling and that kind of thing, of course. But, um, but I think in time, the world is going that way. So, um, so it, it's fun to take advantage of that, but I think a lot of the projects that we've done in the last three years won't really exist because it's gonna become such a critical part of every business out there that they won't be looking for um, some data folks to come in and, and help them out. Um, but but that, it's been a lot of fun, so I'm gonna talk about it. Um, a couple of examples, the Ericsson example and the optimum um, energy example uh, in this talk. Um, okay, so real uh, briefly, so what I want to do is kind of just set some context in terms of why we're talking about this and sort of how, um, you know, how I think of it in relation to the, the rest of um, the course curriculum. So I've been lurking in the corner and kind of uh, for about half the classes and so a sense of um, what you guys have been, have been reading and, and looking at. Um, and then I want to just step through some examples um, and then have a discussion. And really, like, I'm just going to kind of push a lot of information at you, and, and I'm really interested in um, you know, your reaction to that, because I think um, one of the things that Lewis also alluded to is that it, there's an art, and people are very much directed by their past experience and sort of how to approach a problem. So one person might go and you know, I mean, starting with platform and technology decisions, but even down to individual approaches and how they emphasize where they spend their time and even what the deliverable is because as, um, you know, when you're playing the role of data scientist in a project, you are, you're not, be, you won't be prescribed to a certain path. You, that's part of the job is figuring out what, what path you want to go down. Um, but there's a lot of different right answers. So I just want to lay that out there that all of what I'm showing you is kind of like some you know some decisions and, and approaches that we've taken, but certainly not um, not the only not the only ways to think about it. So starting with context, um, you know, if you think about it, sort of as an expanding set. So there's sort of music. Um, you know, th this course is about music and data, and um, you know the the way before the the class started. Blair position this talk was like we'll start sort of focus, and then at the end of the course we can sort of expand out into. Um, you know, more generalized thinking about sound and data, where music may or may not be a part of, of that story. Um, and I think a lot of what's uh, explored in this building is the difference between music and sound fundamentally. Um, that's not even, a, I think, a clear boundary. So, so, uh, so that's kind of like what I want to hit on. So let me start with a, um, an example. So um, this is a pretty simple, like, three-pane iOS app. 
Um, these kinds of views are really popular. They've been more popular, I think, even like in 2000, 2010, like every exec wanted their dashboard that they could go to and it would just make them feel good because they could like have you know, the, you know, the five screens around them of the pulse of the business and understand everything about it. The, the problem with this is that there's not, it's really hard to take action based on when you, what you view and you see things like this. And this is, again, a simple, like this is something you're meant to view on your phone in three different panes. Um, you know, I think I counted like 22 different signals, separate distinct signals in, in these three views. So how do you go about taking action on that becomes the question. And um, this also uh, goes to the earlier point of, you know, there's all kinds of interesting things you can find. The question is, what do you do with it? How is it gonna affect behavior? How can you influence the system that you're um, either instrumenting or um, trying to model? Um, so compare, um, you know, these two, how many people read music? Out of the... Okay, so um, can you tell, so I think everyone is probably familiar with this piece, it's the Russian dance from um, the Nutcracker. Can you tell which row is the melody? This is the conductor's score, so it's necessarily heavy, but, 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 but you all read music, I think. Um, just turn this up. I think the audio music. Okay, I turned it off. I didn't actually start this yet. Let me see. So when you hear it, there's no question. I mean, it's almost like a silly question. Like, you can tell exactly what it is. And then when you find it, it's this violin one that's playing the, the melody. But the point I want to make with this is that sometimes when you're looking at the data in its purest form, and the musical score is a good example, it's completely prescriptive. Like what you're meant to take from it, the primary signal is not even there, even when all of your trombones are resting in the first, <laughs> the first full bar. So, um, so anyway, something to, to think about is like what can, what can sound do? And I think it's something that's really um, specific about um, sort of human sense uh, is that you can use your ear in ways that we probably are not yet at all um, taking advantage of. So. Visual and data visualization is, is a way, but if you think about this as being spark lines or a graph or something else, and this being the sonification, there's a similar opportunity in terms of leveraging what we can do in a second with our ear um, that takes a, a moment of discovery, even with someone who knows what they're looking for, which also is almost never the case. Okay, so that's the <laughs> nut. <laughs> um, Okay, so this, um, so I'm gonna go move into a, an example here. So this is um, a project that we did to build a machine learning system on top of HVAC system, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And these are special HVAC systems that are um, for campus-wide um, deployment. So here at Stanford, we have um, a chilling center that's actually not very far from here by the hospital. The new one's over here. Um, and um, this is a factory um, that's run by a Fortune 100 company that they let us take control of, um, which is cool. Uh, this factory builds 75% of the world's contact lenses, um, so it might be able to figure out whose factory it is, but um, the temperature variance uh, that's allowable for that particular manufacturer is extremely tight, which makes HVAC extremely crucial, and it's in a very hot and weird area, as you saw as we zoomed in for, for weather being um, in Florida. Um, so our partner on this project was Optimum Energy. Um, they were attempting to use um, our skills to build a machine learning package that could be deployed as a Java uh, application into their system that sits alongside the building automation systems generically. So it was a learning system that would sort of go into an arbitrary campus setting um, and be deployed. Um, so some of their, their customers are um, IBM. Um, is a big one, the University of Texas system, so all the main campuses, UT Austin, et cetera, um, and Johnson & Johnson. Um, so here's what sits in the basement, um, a bunch of sort of parallel uh, systems, six or seven here, I guess, um, that were uh, basically these York chillers. Um, they do, um, basically they're cooling water, and they're, they're, they take hot water in and they cool it and they send it out, and that's how, how uh, these things work. The assumption that's made whenever you deploy systems into engineering like this is that similarly specced equipment will run with similar efficiency, which of course is not true, and there's a lot of reasons why it's not true, and it's not really well understood actually in the industry when things are um, run, running efficiently and when not. So um, this was a, a neat project too, to sort of drill in, drill in on that. Um, 
so we built this thing and deployed it. But, but the other thing we did, um, or we learned as we went through sort of the discovery process, is that um, there is this um, tendency. So if you think about the efficiency curve, um, you can, if you run it at sort of very low power, um, you can tend to get more efficiency out of it. So it's not linear, um, it's hyperbolic, but you, you, the closer you get to that trough, the, uh, or the closer you get to the left, sort of the closer you're at the bottom of the trough in terms of efficiency. The challenge with that is, like any machine, if you uh, think about it, an airplane, if you um, sort of sort of stall out, um, you'll start to do some some bad things. And the same thing happens with um, any flow-based system, where if you run it at low power, there's a risk that things start to flow backwards, and then the whole machine will start to shake, and there could be damage. Um, and so that's called a chiller surge. Um, the problem is that we didn't have a response variable to tell us that. Uh, chiller was surging. Nowhere in the data was there um, a labeled, um, you know, column called surge boolean, you know, zero one kind of thing. So, <laughs> which would have been really nice because we could have dropped the power across the whole, um, across the whole site and then across, you know, many different campuses um, by quite a lot and improved efficiency. Um, so we ended up building, and this is almost embarrassing to to show you guys, but um, this is um, a shield. Um, it's a GSM shield. It has, um, you can see, a little SIM card in the bottom right here, um, and a little backup power for a coin cell battery. And this is literally, it looks like, um, you know, bubble gum. It almost is. Um, this is basically a piezo buzzer that's two dollars at Radio Shack, um, which if you if you power it, it'll go buzz. Um, but you can also make it instead of a write, make it a read, and it will tell you how much vibration is going on. Um, and that's basically what we needed was a low cost vibration sensor. And so this is tacked on to this GSM board. This GSM board gets tacked on. Um, in this case, it was you know proof of concept into an Arduino Uno board, and with 100 lines of code, now you're sending data up that gives you a new discrete data point that's your response variable that now you can train hundreds of other parameters that come out of building automation system for that, that response in order um, to look at efficiency. So um, the reason I put it up here is just to show you like a lot of times, you know, that it, the design of, of our economy is that polished products win contracts, um, but uh, underneath the veneer of a lot of those things are is some scrappy engineering that got the job done that then iterates and then becomes um, value, but you, you can get very quickly to that 80% of value creation in some very scrappy ways, and that has a lot to do with um, the reduced cost of hardware, which you can do with IoT, uh, bandwidth, um, IP is now practically free. Um, the carrier's a little behind, but there's um, some different technologies I can talk about at the end that enable you to do backhaul data transfer, uh, super low cost, and then storage and processing as the landscape's completely changed, as you saw in, in Lewis's presentation. So. Um, so that's example uh, number one. I'm gonna talk about the board on the on the uh, on the right there in a minute. Um, so yeah, you can see the parts, the piezo, the LED, um, just nine volt um, and nine volt. It's if we're sampling or we have a wake up sensor, things can run pretty much indefinitely on on little no power. We've been experimenting with um, power harvesting off of fluorescent lights as well. So you actually don't have to plug anything in. You can just stick solar right next to. Um, right next to a fluorescent bulb, and you'll get five volts um, and a thousand milliamps. So, um, some pretty pretty good stuff going on. Um, so, the end of this story was I'm kind of like doing the cooking show thing. I put in like the dough and pull out the bread. But this is the bread. So, at the end, we we basically got to see um, our system was called Adam, and the times when Adam was running, we saw a significant drop. Um, the fun thing about this project, sort of zooming out, is that. If you think about global warming, the biggest sort of uh, effector of global warming is carbon emissions. The biggest uh, um, effector of carbon emissions is uh, energy consumption. The biggest energy usage are actually buildings. It's the buildings in our world, not our planes and cars. And then inside buildings, HVAC is the number one um, sort of uh, energy consumer. So it was sort of an attack problem that hopefully we feel like we can you know, make some, some impact. Um, you know, downstream in terms of global warming. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about two examples where sound is the input and then one where sound is the output, and that's sort of more the sonification um, piece, but I wanted to sort of impress the point of sound as an opportunity for generating um, data um, that can be, can be actionable. Um, so this one, we'll talk about this. So I think everyone knows what this is. Um, 
in my master's program, like there were many people who literally never went up Palm Drive, so um, you may have never seen this before, if <laughs> that's possible, but this is Caltrain, um, obviously like vital connector for the Bay Area in terms of, of commuting. Um, so we got interested in this problem around the time of the Amtrak crash, um, you know, trains and high-speed trains, especially trains running through high population corridors um, have a lot of uh, bad things happen, like people die. Um, here in Palo Alto, we have um, a suicide epidemic, which I'm sure you guys know about, um, with the high schools, and so there's a lot of talk um, in the town. I live in downtown Palo Alto, so there's a lot of talk in the community around how can we make this more safe, how can we limit access, should we invest, would it make a difference if we invested? Um, and then the, the conversation also came down to sort of this two-sided conversation around uh, the railroad horns, and, and they run uh, very early in the morning until very late at night, and they're very um, loud, and so some people were very much against that, other people were sort of upset that they weren't louder. So that, so that it seemed like a good question that could be solved with data, that, well, let's go find out, like, are they too loud or not? Um, so there were some, some specific questions, like I think, you know, just to, to expand on sort of the d data scientist definition, like having, developing hypotheses and then going and testing them is sort of, I think, the difference between um, sort of the danger zone and sort of the rest of the pie chart that's, that's more virtuous, that you're trying to develop some truths um, and you're doing that um, through the scientific method. So our, we had some questions we wanted to go out and, and answer, which is, um, are they being sound at the right time? Um, the schedule, which is a separate question, but there's a lot of accusations around, well, they're always late and all of this, so that, that's something we could answer. Um, are they the correct uh, volume? And then um, the last question is a little bit of a cheat because that became the final finding, but the, um, it wasn't actually an initial question. Um, so the methodology is basically build a sensor that could cap capture uh, the ambient noise level um, and then back, you know, send an uplink, um, and then sort of start that continuous cycle of improving the sensor to, to, and tweaking it to make sure we had what we have, and then um, sort of convert, convert the voltage into decibels, which we'll talk about, and then some, some analysis. Um, so this is our apparatus, super simple. Um, the, the idea was a proof of IoT proof of concept, deploy one thing out. This is something our partners, uh, Helium, up in San Francisco, um, who make uh, a wireless, um, low bandwidth, low power um, network um, with a GSM backhaul, but they can uh, microphone um, and it's plugged into power and ground, and then it's just sending its voltage level over, over to an analog in, and then that was um, piped over to Helium and sent up. So again, not super fancy, um, but got, got the job done. Um, so, we were fortunate that um, one of Rob's family friend and one of the, the staff in the stats department has a house on this corner right here, um, which is very nice because not only is she right next to the, the Caltrain line, which is this gray line sort of next to Alma Street, um, but also halfway between the Palo Alto Caltrain and the, um, and the California Avenue Caltrain, uh, which gave us some nice capability on, on schedule analysis. Um, a couple platforms I just wanted to mention. So Helium I've talked about. Um, so they have their own drag and drop design for different sensors you can deploy out. You can do some processing in their system, send it out, and then you can debug over here. And this is all real time. So it's really important when we're doing our deployment to sort of see the data coming in, ch check the levels, and then um, we did some modeling at set that I'll show you in a second. Um, another um, system was Librato, and these guys have been acquired. I should have their new company name up here, but um, this was super valuable for sort of initial visualization, and um, there's sort of two pieces. One is sort of, um, you know, tweaking and futzing and getting the collection right. Then there's sort of discovery, and then there's reporting, and I really think about data visualization and, and sonification as well as you need to sort of separate those activities because each of them requires different, um, different things in terms of latency, um, fidelity, um, and, and capability, that kind of thing. Um, okay, so going back to our sound, so this is a, a sound sample that we pulled off, um, and one of the interesting things here is that if you look at the sound, you can tell it has a transpassing actually. The sound is quite a bit higher than the horn itself, where the chief complaint was um, the horn. So there was all these conversations around, should we make the horn louder or softer, or put it under the train or on top of the train? Um, 
but this was you know sort of a, a, a sort of a hmm moment where we could see actually the thing that people are, are missing is that it's, it's the sound wheels, not the horn that um, that could be affecting things. So this is the raw data. This is just, and you can see is probably what we'd expect, sort of a baseline set um, of, of sound with some outliers um, that sit in there. And this is just looking at, at one day. And this is um, as voltage um, here in terms of what's coming off. Um, and then this is where it gets a little bit embarrassing in terms of the, the sort of um, scrappiness. But this is the, the screen paint I was showing you. And this is a XTEC. Uh, sound meter from Fry's for $7, then basically gives you the, the decibel rating. So what I was doing is sitting uh, in, in the backyard of this person whose house we deployed in and then basically mapping um, decibel readings and trying to create a two point plot so that then we could do a very simple um, regression that then give us a linear path so we, kind of, we could approximate um, decibels. So the first question was like train schedule, like are things running on time? Um, and you can see, like generally, um, so red here is the northbound train and green is the southbound train. And you can see um, we tend to run, um, you know, things tend to sort of line up pretty well. Also, it sort of confirmed what we thought, which is that trains do make, you know, some sound. But then there are these um, other cases where things sort of sat off cycle um, that sort of made us wonder what's going on. Um, and another sound sample. Um, so we saw sort of this binaural behavior too, where there's like all of this activity here, and then there were some sort of a, uh, another um, sort of mode up here around, you know, a much, much higher and louder um, set of stuff. Um, Alma Street's a, a feeder for a lot of emergency transport, so Safer Hospital feeds down Alma, as Pellets Police Department does as well, so, you know, you definitely get with Caltrain, uh, you get Alma, with Alma you get a lot of um, other specific types of traffic. Um, zooming in, it was kind of neat. This is another sort of a discovery that we, we hadn't thought about, but um, you get the this signal changes. So every three minutes or so, you get a signal change, and that, that as the traffic sort of surging by, accelerating all the gasoline motors, sort of and then going by and sort of create these peaks at sort of um, a nice periodic rate. And then there's also this, which I didn't throw a recording in for, but you get the northbound or the southbound traffic uh, first because Helen's on the north east corner, so you get the southbound traffic, and then you get the northbound traffic revving up behind it, so you get sort of this, um, sort of that, that little little hump as well. Um, so again, you know, we saw, yeah, when you look at the scheduled times in a minute around the scheduled time for northbound and southbound, you can see some of this, but it wasn't as clean as you kind of wanted in during these, these things. So, so really what we discovered going back into it was, um, you know, um, you know, basically we knew from the, the outcome that there's a Federal Railroad Agency um, mandate in terms of how loud things are. They're actually well under that, so, um, so that sort of quiets the argument of like, these things are too loud. It's like, well, maybe, but they're, um, they're also not even yet to the threshold of what the law says. Um, there's also another thing I didn't put on here, but um, FRA was, you know, those, these laws were sort of developed in a time where the population was more sparse and there's a requirement that they, they sound like 30 seconds, I think, before crossing, um, which is ridiculous uh, for Caltrain, like going up and down the corridor, because 30 seconds before crossing is all the time. Like they would just like hold their hand on the horn, I think, if that were, if they followed the rule. Um, so we found like the traffic was a, sort of had a, had a lot of baseline, um, so really high. The sirens, the construction that was going on had the loudest events. Um, and then the, the final point that I'll just hammer home is that it's really simple sensor um, setups can give you, you know, pretty rich discovery. The obvious next step here would be to deploy you know, 100 or 1,000 of these things and, and um, sort of do it right and, and do it longitudinally. Um, so that was that one. Okay, so the final example. How are we doing for time, by the way? Do we, um, am I? Yeah. 17 minutes. Good, perfect, okay. Um, so this one is um, around a project that we did for Ericsson. So this was a team uh, that's focused on delivering video on demand, um, and they do this for the majority of uh, set-top boxes around the world. Um, and so they have a service design that they um, deploy, um, and this is a, a two-way correlation plot. So each of these is a service uh, that runs on a separate box. 
Um, and then what we were looking to do initially was sort of figure out what the bottlenecks are. And of course, the place to start is to think about the correlation um, between what we're seeing uh, for latency across the different services so we could start to root cause. And the, the problem with this is it's a hierarchical problem. If you think about a video service, you have um, you know, a bunch of systems that, that you know, store the content, a bunch of systems that sort of stage it, and then a bunch of systems that sort of are responsible for provisioning and licensing and these kinds of things. Um, and then you have the, you know, the front ends that are actually responsible for dishing it up. Um, so of course, the, you, know, you start by looking at, at the front, but oftentimes what's really, uh, what the issue is, is it could be several steps back. So we were sort of called in to, to sort of root this out from um, the service logs that they, that they had. Um, the, the issue with um, you know, a place like this, which is running at that scale, is that you have usually a room that looks something like this. Um, so it's sort of the more NASA-like setup, where you have sort of the big you know, screens up on the wall, and then a bunch of people that sit in there and um, play Doom, basically, until like, something bad happens. That's <laughs> what I've seen anyway. Um, I guess people don't play Doom anymore. I need to update more. Um, anyway, so that's kind of the, what goes on in systems operation centers. Um, and uh, that's, that's all good, and it's good to have you know, folks on site sort of thinking about your, your, your systems. But we kind of lost something, I think, as a society in, in you know, going from the Industrial Revolution information, where if you're imagining like this is your view as a manager out onto your plant like 100 years ago, you, know, you can kind of hear like what's going on. You're going to hear like riveting going on there. These chains are going to make a sound. If one of those chains breaks, like it's going to make a really gnarly sound. Um, you'll know something. You could be like in your office doing paperwork, and you would hear that sound, and you'd run down to sort of help with the issue. So there was this capability we had when things were physical that sort of drew on how we're built as humans um, that we kind of lost in, along the way. And what we're left with is data visualization, which um, can be okay, but it's it can be sort of an unguided experience in terms of what you're looking at and when you're looking at it. Um, and so we were thinking about this problem for, for them sort of after, after answering the, the original question sort of to how do you, rather than root cause issues um, in sort of a fault detection and diagnosis scenario, move into um, prediction and then also instant notification so that you have human machines sort of working um, in, in Symfony uh, well together. Um, so this is um, where um, I gave Rob a call. I'm like, hey, you're at Karma. Like, maybe you could help me out with this problem. And um, so uh, he said, sure. And he came over, and we, we started pulling data sets out, and we looked at a day. Um, and he was, he was working with Chuck at this time. Um, and uh, basically, we, we took some tools um, that you can find on the internet um, and sort of put them together um, to sort of um, help the clients understand sort of what was going on. And, um, so let me just play. If you guys can hear this, I'll play a little bit of it, and then I'll stop it and tell you what you're listening to. So you can see it starts out pretty quiet. I'm going to move into the middle here. I think I can make that much louder. So there's kind of um, two things going on. So if you hear, there's kind of a background set of noises, and then there's sort of an event set of noises. So given the, the problem and trying to sort of recreate this um, you know, 20th century factory situation for the systems operations center for a, uh, a data center, the idea was let's put something in the background that can help them just hear um, when a system's running or a set of systems is running in a certain way. And then let's also put in events. So the chime that you hear, if it's a clean bell sound, that means it was a zero latency uh, call to that service. Um, if it's a more of a clarinetti sound, um, then it's uh, it had some latency, and the pitch of of that sound is basically how much latency. So once you've listened for a little bit, you start to get some intuition for like how the machine's running, and you can do this for you know at scale. You can do it across a lot of different instruments and different frequency ranges and that kind of thing, and start to really kind of hear things that, that would um, alert you. The other note about the background sound is it's also taking um, a, a moving average of the prior 100 points and then basically taking the latency of that. So as, 
as the system is running progressively worse, it'll start to sort of sound both higher pitch and grittier uh, in terms of the sound. So you sort of can start to feel some intuition about like how, when and how the system's running. Here it's, uh, it was a pretty healthy day, but you can hear a mixture of, of zero latency and, and some latency events. Um, so that was the, the data sonification piece that, um, that I wanted to, to share. So um, the last point um, I wanted to make was, um, did you guys look at this in class? This, no. this view? Okay, so you can buy this, I think, as a poster, but um, Edward Tufte, do you guys know who Edward Tufte is? So he's a data visualization guy. He, he runs these gigantic like data visualization summits at convention centers that you can pay like $400 and you get the book for free kind of thing. Um, anyway, it's fun, it's worth going, but this is, he, has, he has a whole, he's collected sort of like the, the, the greatest hits around data visualization. And this was a, a really old one, um, but shows you, you know, over time, um, sort of the, uh, the market penetration of different music types and the history of, of R&B. Um, and so you can stare at this thing for a long time. It's kind of like suited for a poster because you kind of want to like look, look in here and see, you know, we're looking um, from 1955 to 1975, I think is where it ends up. And you can see sort of the birth of different things, pop folk. And when you get down here towards 1975, you can start to make conclusions as an observer. If you spend some time like really thinking about it, about, wow, like, there's this blend of things that happened, you know, around um, you know, R&B to rock and um, and rock to rap um, that you know you can you can sort of stare at the visualization, which is a very clever and beautiful visualization. But it takes a lot of interpretation to get to that point. So I want to compare that just um, for one last example to um, you know thinking again about sort of rock and roll to rock to rap, what you can get from like a view like this versus hearing it. So I want to play. A music. Okay, so um, I don't know if that had the same effect on you, but for me, like mashups like that start to like, you, you're forced to sort of stack and reconcile like different musical styles. Um, sometimes that's the intention of the person that put it together, sometimes it's not, but I thought, you know, that was a decent example after listening to a few dozen of these that sort of does that in chronological order where in, you know, what was that, like 25 seconds, you sort of get 30 years of rock history blending into um, rap. And you're sort of forced to say, okay, it's, what is the relationship between those? How did the voice style change between rock and roll and rock, and how did that feed into rap? And um, so, anyway, I wanted to make that point that I think we're just now, um, you know, sort of scratching the surface um, in terms of what can be done with sound, um, specifically in the field of data science and um, data recognition, um, and just sort of encourage folks. Um, I was talking, um, you know, before class about this that you know there. There is not really anything out there today that does this well. Uh, I would love, as a data scientist, if I could go in to the, a situation like Ericsson and sort of have a recommended um, product or a service that would enable people to sort of use all their senses in order to consume data, and it, it just doesn't exist. So, um, so in terms of projects or what your thesis is going to be or maybe the company you're gonna start, um, these are all areas that I think are really uh, fertile and, and open to opportunity. Um, last point I want to make sort of related is, um, you know, the fact that you're here, that you're interested in sound, that you're interested in data, and, and, and you're at Stanford, it, you have sort of unlimited options. So um, definitely, if you're not loving what you're working on at any given point, either academic or, um, you know, or professionally, um, make a change because um, you, there's tons and tons of opportunity, especially um, in data. So I will stop there.
got a couple minutes, so questions or thoughts or criticisms I'd love. Yeah. Uh, how, how did you kind of map the different features of those sounds in the Ericsson project to what was going on? How did you kind of draw meaning? Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question. So we settled in on um, the two, so sort of the twin goals of anomaly detection and sort of steady state, um, you know, understanding steady state, which I think is, is important that if you don't have sort of a steady state signal running in the background, um, it's very difficult for people to engage with your system. And I think that's true across the board. If it's literally a red light on a dashboard that's just off all the time, like you're not gonna be thinking about that thing at all. In some cases, that's a good thing. You don't need to think about your oil level every time you get in your car, but there are some spaces where knowing how things are running, even when it's not critical, um, becomes the most important thing. And especially where a lot of what we're seeing is people sort of making this transition from failure state recovery and fault detection and diagnosis into optimization and prediction. Um, and uh, much of that will always, I would argue, is going to be dependent, you know, no matter how many, you know, how wide your data set gets and how many fancy, you know, f you know how much fancy feature engineering you've done through PCA reduction and, and other techniques, you're still going to be very dependent on the people's intuition that work the most closely with the machine. And um, in, the, in the optimum energy example, um, you know, the, the last mile of deployment was the, the engineers that, that work on site you know, with the wrench in their hand, literally on, on the systems. And so if you haven't converted them, and, and both in the sense of taking advantage of their knowledge, but also giving them tools to use the system, you kind of miss the opportunity. But that was sort of the goal there, is like, what's the thing that someone who's sitting in the systems operations center could actually use? They can, they, it'd be useful for them to know when things are okay, gain intuition about what precedes when things are going wrong, which we don't know, um, and then also respond um, to situations uh, when, they, when they happen. Um, and then a point that Lewis made before class as well and came up in, in our conversation also is, you know, there's this notion that the human is designed to, you know, identify a problem and then go and execute on it and put our heads down on it. And that's exactly what happens in, in data centers. And, um, you know, at, at Microsoft, when you, we, we had a couple of outages where people couldn't activate their, you know, their version of Windows or they couldn't send their crash reports, <laughs> you know, and, and then you're on just conference calls where everyone's swarming the problem for hours on end. Um, but you can miss something that's happening in a completely different area. And sort of Murphy's Law means that always happens, and so an, a capability to create an augmented signal, even on a different track from the primary focus, um, can be uh, pretty important. Yeah, other questions? Yeah. Um, in, I know this might be a little weird, but uh, in the realm of senses, what do you think are most sort of intuitive senses? Like, if there was an ultimate way of, um, like, what do you, I guess, if you could turn data into anything, whether it's, in, you know, visualizing it or having it be sonified or, you know, maybe touch, what do you think would be, like, you know, the highest you could get? Yeah, I'm smiling because there's a parody video of uh, the WeSop program, which is basically a, so some spoof, so let me, where it was, uh, a chair that engineers at Microsoft had to sit in, and every time their app crashed, like a needle came up and jabbed them. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be like a good, a good yeah, acute yeah. <laughs> sensory experience. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a hot topic with wearables and haptic control, you know, um, and I think it comes down to the scenario that you're going after. Like the idea of being able to give your Uber driver directions by a slight vibration on the left or right of their shoulder instead of having them looking at their phone, like, Right away, there's a safety you know, improvement there. And so, so it kind of depends. Um, I, I don't know the answer. I think there's a physiological answer to it, probably, which is people say that scent has the strongest association with memory. I certainly haven't seen any data sniff snification. I don't know what the word would be. <laughs> but uh, maybe that's coming. Maybe that's the next startup. Huh. Yeah, I was just thinking like humans are really good at like detecting when something tastes or smells off. So it could be like a more useful, like, <laughs> yeah. It's a very really active environment to be in. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, Do you smell that? No, I feel that though. You know, the restrictions on what you eat for money. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. We're pressed over quickly. Yeah. Oh, we got this one. Things are all bad. Yeah. Come yeah. on. Anything else? Or anything else related to you guys' projects that uh, you'd like to bring up? I didn't talk much about tooling or any of the technical side of this. 
Actually, yeah. I mean, I'm kind of interested. So you mentioned Chuck a couple slides back. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I'm, I'm kind of interested. That might be more specific question, though. Cool. Yeah, I'll follow up with you, and um, Rob's coming back in today, and um, he wrote the code for that piece as well. Perfect. Yeah, I'm sure he'd be happy to talk. Uh, cool. Yeah, Lewis. How was uh, the project received by the um, Well, so it's, we, we, we're a consultancy, so we have a model where we are always working against a set of project deliverables um, in a project. We design our projects that way, so, um, you know, we can sort of open the project and close the project. Uh, but then we always have sort of the, the reach goals or the bonus material um, in our project. And that was a bonus material piece. Um, and um, so I think it's, it's a great question because there is, when you do something novel, it's always sort of, especially when your audience is fault detection and diagnosis, it's a challenge. Uh, but I think people, uh, they, they definitely got it and were interested in, in it as a prototype for their, their sock, so. But I think that uh, maybe to temper the, the comment around like running off and starting a company on I think that would be the challenge is like you have to you have to have the the real gem of the scenario that saves the day that there's no other solution for or the other solution is you know 10x more expensive or something like that. Um, but uh, but again, it's it's just un, uncharted territory. Is there one more question in the front? Oh, I was um, I guess. I was thinking more about the sonification thing. Like, how much training do you think would be necessary if you were to really create like a, a sonified data? You know, like if you were someone working in this data center uh, or uh, like all detection mm -hmm. center, would you need to train much to be able to interpret the? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I think the thing that I didn't say but sort of implied is that there's intuition baked into sensory feedback that you you don't get when you're looking at maybe a table of numbers um, where you might have some like rules that you've developed in, in your head and we see this a lot. We just finished a, a project working on fraud with Starbucks where the whole analyst team knew some magic numbers and when they saw exceptions to that, then they would investigate. Um, but it wasn't something that was designed, it was just learned. And that's a really hard way to go about, um, about the problem, about kind of any problem, is rely on sort of the, um, the organizational knowledge and knowing that that's gonna be uniform. Um, so I think the I ideal is that you can, through sound, through colors, through um, different types of visualizations, you can draw attention to the things that are most important. Because ultimately, like, if you're talking about the, the data to sound or data to visual, that's the only goal. You're trying to emphasize, someone is making a curated decision about what the observer needs to see at any given point. Um, you know, there is data discovery tools and these kinds of things, but, but even there, like I would argue, you have to make a call in terms of what you're highlighting. Um, yeah? Yeah, I mean, Bill, do you think there's a chance of like obscuring um, problems by like, Prejudging um, data. So, like, for instance, the um, you have the bell tone, like the clear bell tone, yeah, um, which is you know a good thing to hear. Um, but I don't know if there be some cases in which actually, I mean, maybe zero latency is always a good thing, but in which that judgment actually isn't right. Yeah, like you wouldn't want to hear, the, you know clear bell tones yeah. uh, or something like that, you know? Yeah, it's a great point, and it speaks to sort of the middle layer that we didn't talk about at all in terms of that curation and the optimization of that. So think back on, um, on Lewis's slide, he had, I forget the two, the two technologies you had side by side, but one, you sort of required this many CPUs and one you required this many CPUs. Well, if you threw the same number of CPUs and you're, those are dedicated machines at the, new, at the new problem with the different underlying hardware, you'd be massively overpaying. So, um, so yeah, so I, I think there is a scenario even there where what is the threshold? Like what's actually good enough? Like where's the sweet spot in terms of your return on investment given that, yeah, if you throw enough money at, at any um, you know, sort of data problem, you can scale to the point where it goes away, but how much does that last five or 10% really worth? And who, who makes that call? Who's informed enough to make that call? And do they have the tools and information in front of them that they can, they can make it well? Um, another example here was from the, uh, the optimum energy example with the, 
the vibration sensor. So the, the rule was 15%, like you just buffer everything 15%. Uh, for at Microsoft, we would just purchase 2x and sometimes 10x depending on the service so that we knew we wouldn't run into the problem. But that's obviously not a data informed decision in, in a dynamic uh, provisioning environment like AWS, like it's, doesn't, it's not required. <laughs> you don't have to make that decision, it's a false choice. So, uh, so I think the, change, the nature of change in terms of what's happening in, in the platform and, and tools along with the, how, how fast you can get information informed decisions and even affect the design of those systems is, is crucial. Cool. Well, I think All I'm right. here, but um, I don't know if you can see I can hang out, but, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have office hours after the shoot upstairs if anyone wants to So thank you, cool. Cameron. Yeah, thank you very much, guys.